This sermon is for those who've had enough. For those who've watched as the Jewish community has grown angrier, narrower, more defensive, more oppositional. This sermon is for those who are tired of a politics of fear that drives so much of the conversation around Israel. This sermon is for those who are sick of hearing Jews call each other capo and Nazi and warmonger and idiot, who are disgusted by the rancor, who are fed up with all the yelling, who are done, done with the pandering and the propagandizing and the politicizing. This sermon is for those who are tired of being told that there is one way and one way only to show our love of Israel or to address questions of Israeli and American national security. This sermon is for those who have watched the trends on their Facebook feed, who read the paper with a growing dismay, who with each community flare up, feel an increasing sense of alienation from the Jewish conversation. This sermon is for those people who are so fed up that you're all but ready to walk away. And for the rest of you, for those of you who feel really well represented in the mainstream, who feel comfortably a part of the establishment, I hope that you will listen anyway. Number one, because you're here, so you may as well. And number two, because this sermon is about your kids, maybe your future kids, maybe your grandkids, who will one day get to college. And when they do, they will be confronted by a vigorous challenge to everything that they have been taught about Israel and about Judaism. They will most likely find themselves there forced to choose between increasingly hostile camps. On one hand, they may be held personally responsible for the most reprehensible decisions and actions of Israel's government. They will be told that Israel is a pariah state. They will be pressured to support the BDS movement, boycott, divestment, and sanctions. On the other hand, if they dare speak out against Israeli policies or actions that hurt their hearts, they will risk being deemed a self-hating Jew or even an anti-Semite. They could be entered on blacklist databases purportedly dedicated to exposing bigotry on campus. In either case, their instinct will likely be like it has been for so many before them, to walk away altogether. You're not gonna like everything that I'm gonna say today. I apologize in advance if I upset you. This is not the sermon that I wanted to give today. I wrote six sermons this year for Yom Kippur Day. Endless hours did I spend with David Light in the middle of the night, trying to get him to permit me to give one of the six sermons that I wanted to give, but he said no. <laughs> On Yom Kippur, you speak your truth. And so that's what I will do today. So I apologize if I upset you, but I hope you'll listen anyway, because this sermon might help make your conversation with your kid or with your colleague or with your friend or with your parent a little bit more productive. Last year, last night, I gave us all permission on this new year to walk away from something that's no longer working rather than endlessly bang our heads against the wall. Today, I want you to know that I'm taking it all back. Today, I'm gonna beg you to stay, at least in this conversation, not to give up so quickly to this particular dream. So this is a very simple sermon. All I'm gonna do is give you the four best reasons that I can think of of why you should stay. Number one. Israel is a really good and a really important idea. The revolution of Zionism was nothing short of the promise of the transformation of the Jew from a passive, apologetic, self-abnegating nebbish to a strong, self-confident, self-realized Sabra. Israel is the great response to the powerlessness and lack of agency that define the diasporic condition, the searing image, of Chaim Nachman Bialik after the Kishinev pogrom in 1903, the image of a pale, fragile Jew hiding beneath his bed while the Cossacks attacked his wife, that image fueled the early Zionists. It fed their imagination. The Jew needed to reclaim his humanity, his masculinity, her agency, her visibility in history. 
And all of that was before the Holocaust, before the catastrophic disruption to the Jewish sense of self. As Rabbi Harold Schulweis said, the Holocaust is the dominant psychic reality of all of our lives. The trauma of the destruction of Eastern European Jewry, the murder of millions of people was a tectonic shift in Jewish history that informed every subsequent conversation, decision, or action regarding a Jew's position in the world, whether in Israel, in Europe, here in the United States. The Holocaust is so deeply embedded in the consciousness of the Jew that the former head of the Shin Bet, Ami Ayalon, once said that after an attack, the Jews don't count our dead one, two, three. We count six million one, six million two, six million three. Every Jewish death is felt by the entire nation. Every loss is seen as all of our loss. Every murder falls on the open wounds of our past, each one reinforcing our eternal vulnerability as a people. Our great collective trauma has not faded into the past because it regenerates itself with every rocket, with every kidnapping, with every shooting, whether it's in Beersheba or Paris or Kansas City. Every year, the Israeli Air Force flies over Auschwitz on Holocaust Remembrance Day, symbolizing a people reborn from the ashes. Chief of Staff Gabi Ashkenazi spoke at Auschwitz on this occasion in 2008, and here's what he said. 63 years have passed since the end of the most horrible war humankind has ever known. 63 years after the atrocity. The Star of David is no longer a mark of disgrace, but a symbol and a sign of the resurrection of the Jewish people. As commander of the IDF, the fighting force of the mighty Jewish state, I stand here with pride and honor, he said, to pledge never again. Never again will we stand helpless, crying for the mercy of others. Never again will we beg to be defended. Never again will we allow our sons and our daughters, our parents and our grandparents to be erased from the face of the earth. Never again shall the frightened eyes of Jewish children look with ghastly dread through barbed wire fences of concentration camps. Never again. The dream of a place in which a Jew could defend himself, herself, their family. A strong, secure Jewish state has transformed that fantasy now into a reality. And lest we believe that the need for Israel as a refuge has outlived its utility, I want to invite us to think about the kosher marketplace terrorist attack in Paris this winter, which many saw as a reminder of the ever-present dangers facing the Jewish community. This is particularly important for us, progressive American Jews, to remember. Peter Beinart wrote a great piece this winter saying that the experience of post-Holocaust, post-Six-Day War American-born Jews has been freakishly fortunate. That 21st century America is not only not anti-Semitic, it's wildly philo-Semitic. He argued that our liberalism is a product of that experience. It naturally inclines us toward a more benign view of Gentiles and of human nature itself. And of course, it shapes our perspective of Israel. Had we spent the past several decades facing the daily threats of anti-Semitism and terrorism, we would also be very cynical and we would also be distrustful. We would be beleaguered. We would be defensive. Beinart reminds us, if you're a Jew living in the U.S. today, you may have contemplated moving to Israel out of ideological or religious fervor, but unlike many young Jews in France, you have never contemplated moving there out of fear. And even still, even still, Israel's not intended to be only a refuge. In the language of Ben-Gurion, Zionism is nothing short of a revolt against destiny. A chance not only to survive history, but to master our fate, to take our destiny into our own hands. With the establishment of the State of Israel came the opportunity for the first time in 2,000 years for the full realization of Judaism. This state was built on a dream that Jewish morals and values, prophetic insight, 
Creativity, imagination could manifest themselves in the public square. The Zionist vision is not just of a safe haven, but of a cultural center, a spiritual heartland, a homeland for the Jewish people, a source of intellectual, artistic, and religious inspiration for Jews everywhere, a place for Hebrew language and culture to flourish, a precious, rare opportunity for Jewish values to finally be fully realized. Point number one, Israel is a really good and really important idea. <clears throat> number two, in pursuit of this really good and really important idea, Israeli and the American Jewish leadership have done a lot right, and they have also made some terrible, terrible mistakes. You've heard, of course, about many of the extraordinary achievements of the past 67 years, from the breathtaking advances in medicine and technology to the against all odds success of the startup nation. You've heard about the ingathering of millions of refugees and immigrants, Jews whose home countries were no longer safe or hospitable to them. Israel absorbed a brand new state in its first few years, hundreds of thousands of refugees from Europe who had nowhere else to go. And in the next couple of decades, a million Jews who fled or were expelled from Arab lands, 100,000 Ethiopian Jews, more than a million Jews from the former Soviet Union. You've heard about unimaginable triumphs and marvels and miracles. But for some reason, none of that was enough to keep you in the conversation. Because what you long for, what you dream of, what you hope for but don't hear enough of is honest self-reflection. Cheshbon ha-nefesh, you're tired of spin. You don't want any more PR. You want and you deserve more than that. Israel, for all its great achievements, has yet to live up to its own great aspirations. The dream of the early Zionists and early founders of a Jewish and democratic state based on freedom, justice, and peace as envisaged by the prophets of Israel has yet to be realized. The occupation of the West Bank is now in its 48th year. It's older than many of you. It's older than me. This is not something that American Jews like to talk about. It's not something you probably heard a lot about in your home growing up or in your religious school. And yet I know that this is at least part of the reason that you're all but ready to walk away. I've heard as much from many of you. Here's what you need to know. There are many serious, committed Zionists and serious, committed Jews, people who live in Israel, people who love Israel, who believe from their core, from our core, that the treatment of the Palestinian people, the restriction of their rights, the daily humiliations and the stubborn expansion of the settlements threatens to destroy not only Zionism, but to make a mockery out of Judaism. We need to own this. We need to acknowledge this. For all the unfair and disproportionate criticism that Israel receives from critics around the world, and yes, some of them are actual anti-Semites, at the end of the day, we need to acknowledge that Israel does not just have a PR problem. It has a policy problem. And the American Jewish establishment, the American Jewish establishment made a major miscalculation regarding this policy problem. For many years, our communal leadership thought we were doing the right thing by silently acquiescing when one Israeli government after another supported settlement expansion, thinking eventually, eventually this will put us in a position where we can trade land for peace. But the peace didn't come. Arafat dodged and evaded, Rabin was murdered, and now there are nearly 400,000 Jewish settlers living in the West Bank. Initially, many of them were there for the view and the cheap rent. Some of them still are. But our script did not adjust one bit even as the settler population began to grow more ideological, more religious, more violent, and more committed to staying forever. Instead, we put on blinders, and we focused on growing European anti-Semitism. We focused on the Iranian nuclear threat, and we talked a lot about the failures of the Palestinian leadership. 
But in doing so, we did not calculate that we would lose you. You, frustrated by the double standard, witnessing Jewish communal pride as we focus and give so generously to the poor and vulnerable in Haiti and Kathmandu and in Liberia, but confounded by our community's moral blind spot to the poor and vulnerable in our own backyard, like those who live in Aris, Arab East Jerusalem, where 79% of the population lives in poverty. <coughs> this summer, I taught an extraordinary group of young European Jews in Sweden at Paideia, and one of them told her story. She grew up at Jewish camp in Sweden, waving the Israeli flag, singing Hatikva, celebrating Yom Ma'ud. She fell so deeply in love with Israel that as soon as she could, she went off to study in Jerusalem. Right when she arrived, she encountered for the first time Arab Israelis and Palestinians. She heard their stories, she saw their struggles, and she felt not only a great sadness about their plight, but also anger because she felt like she had been lied to her entire life. Some of you have felt the very same way. Did they not think we were smart enough or strong enough to hold this complexity, you have wondered? I need you to know that nobody was trying to trick you or deceive you, but they knew that this stuff is really painful and complicated and very, very hard to hear. Your parents and your day school teachers and your rabbis were concerned that if you heard all of this, if we had a really honest conversation about the day-to-day -day struggles, you would lose sympathy for the Jewish narrative altogether, you'd throw up your hands and walk away. What they did not realize is that not knowing is even worse, because then once you learn, you feel like you've been misled. Number one, Israel is a really good and really important idea. Number two, in the pursuit of this really good and really important idea, some very serious mistakes have been made. Number three, there are many Israelis and Palestinians who are working together right now to change this script. It may seem to you that there is a broad consensus around how to support and love and defend Israel. Much of it has been aligned, especially lately, with right-leaning politics, both in DC and in Jerusalem. It's important for you to know that there is a strong and serious and loving opposition to the status quo, both here in this country and also in Israel, among activists and artists and rabbis and even military specialists who have a very different sense about how best to support Israel. We met many of them on our community's trip to Israel this summer. These are people who are fighting every single day for Israel to realize its great promise and its potential, to embody the dreams of their founders, a Jewish and democratic state. Thankfully, Israel still remains a place in which those voices are heard. There's Avner Givar Yahu from Breaking the Silence, who took me for an entire day last summer to Hebron. I wanted to see the cave of Machpelah, the ancient burial site of Abraham, Sarah, Isaac, Rebecca, Jacob, and Leah. Hebron holds centuries of tears and memories and yearnings for the Jewish people. It is also the site of Baruch Goldstein's bloody rampage against Muslim worshipers in 1993. Today, Hebron is one of the most contested cities in the entire world. There are 650 Israeli soldiers guarding 750 extremist Jewish settlers who live in the midst of 200,000 Palestinians in Hebron. Avner was a paratrooper there for three years in the Israeli army, so he knows the streets intimately. He showed me the Kasbah, which was once thriving and is now shuttered. He showed me the new Jewish settlements that have been established in the last couple of years. And I asked him, Avner, why do you bother shuttling Israeli and American Jews to Hebron several times a week? And here's what he said to me. I do this for exactly the same reason that I served in the IDF as a paratrooper. I love this country enough to fight for it. There's a Nat Hoffman. Israel's leading champion of pluralism and religious freedom. We met her in Jerusalem this summer, and she implored our group not to give up on Israel. 
She asked us to amplify the efforts of courageous folks who are fighting for Israel to honor and uphold Jewish and democratic commitments. Israel, she said, is too important to be left to the Israelis. And we chuckled nervously and she said, no, I'm serious, I mean it, we need you. There's my beloved friend, Rabbi Tamar Elad Applebaum from Jerusalem, who came to Ikar in the spring and told our community that the question of the future of Israel stands in the center of her life. The Israeli world that I come from, she said, is a society in grief. I belong to a world of hundreds of thousands of Israelis who are social activists and work hard every day alongside the poor and the refugees and the elderly and the vulnerable children, Jews and non-Jews. And they ask themselves if they can find the energy to keep holding the miracle that is now on the verge of disaster called the State of Israel. Many of these people are in despair, she said. Many of them are exhausted. Many see the challenges. They do not know if they will ever be able to overcome these challenges. She talked to us about how she created her community in Jerusalem called Sion in response to that growing despair. I decided to create a community that would take a leap of faith into the future to create the life that we wished for and to show our children that this is what we were supposed to do in Eretz Yisrael. There are also so many Palestinians who are working every day to find nonviolent ways of resolving this conflict, who reject Palestinian terrorism, who reject extremism, who risk their lives and their livelihoods to make space for a different kind of conversation between Palestinians and Jews. One of them is our friend Ali Abu Awad. He came to Ikar twice last year. He's coming back in the spring. He likes it here. He told us that his whole life became meaningful the moment he saw a grieving Israeli mother weep. And he realized that Jews also have tears. Since then, he's dedicated his life to building connections between Israelis and Palestinians. How can we ever make peace, he said, if we cannot see the humanity in one another. There's Sami Awad from the Holy Land Trust. We met Sami at Ali's house. His daughter was there too. And when she walked away, he told us this, my daughter's been asking a lot lately if she'll be able to ever meet a zebra or an elephant in the flesh. The problem is that as Palestinians living in Bethlehem, they can't get a permit to go to the zoo in Jerusalem just a few miles away. The Jewish community needs to know that Sami is so committed to the path of nonviolence. He believes so deeply in the possibility of peace that he will not tell her daughter the real reason that he can't take her to the zoo. Instead, he tells her that he's too busy with work, that maybe they'll go another day. He lies to his daughter rather than plant seeds of hatred in her young mind. The presence of Ali and Sami and other Palestinians like them does not mean that Hamas is not a terrorist organization that wants to destroy all of Israel river to the sea. And yet it is so important for us to remember that there are also other voices out there. These are the voices that I want you to hear. These are the Israeli Jews and the Palestinians who share our Jewish and democratic values, who are willing to fight tirelessly for justice and peace and who are not willing to give up. How can we walk away when they've lost so much and they continue to fight? Number four, there is room for your voice in this conversation. We need your voice in this conversation. I wanna say a word about the myth of consensus. The Prime Minister stood up this year and claimed to speak on behalf of all of the Jews. I can't even speak on behalf of all of the Jews at my dinner table. <laughs> there are Jewish agencies and organizations that cannot help themselves but claim to speak on behalf of all of us. Some of them take out full page ads in the New York Times claiming to represent the best interests of the Jews. Words like unity abound in the public Jewish space. And what are you to learn from this? That if such unity exists in the Jewish conversation, you're clearly not a part of it. I ask you not to believe it. In the Jewish community, there is a surplus of certainty and a deficit of humility. 
And that's why we need you. Before you walk away, you need to know that we need your challenges and your questions, your creativity, your imagination, your sense of urgency, your uncertainty. Just because you're still figuring it out doesn't mean that you have to leave the conversation. We need your Jewish heart, your ability to hope and dream, your moral sensitivity and compassion and perspective. We need your voice, curious, open-minded, and humane. So today I'm asking something of you. Rather than walk away, you need to step in. You need to read and learn and visit and imagine a different kind of conversation, one in which we hear one another's voices and we listen with compassion. And when we offer an alternative perspective, it's without nastiness or self-righteousness, but truly in the interest of advancing the conversation. Some people will tell you, believe me, they'll tell you, that the world criticizes Israel disproportionately, that there are far more egregious crimes being committed in Saudi Arabia and Syria and Iran and Egypt, and you can tell them that they're right. And that even still, the Jew builds her moral compass not based on the standards of criminal regimes that live on our borders, but based on our own values, articulated in Torah, fine-tuned over the course of thousands of years. And when policies are enacted by the Jewish state that are fundamentally and dangerously incompatible with our core values, we all have an obligation to speak out. People will tell you that speaking against Israeli policies is dangerous and irresponsible because it's airing dirty laundry that only fuels the hatred of Israel and gives fodder to the anti-Semites. You can tell them that the jig is up. We hit the tipping point. Israel's rightward shift over the past many years is no secret. And after the Jewish terrorist attacks at the Jerusalem Pride Parade this summer, and then the firebombing of the Palestinian home in Duma, to not speak out against the growing threat of Jewish extremist violence is what's dangerous and irresponsible. Other people will tell you that BDS, the boycott movement, is the only way to change, to change Israel's policies, the only way to end the occupation. And you can reframe the conversation for them. You can tell them that you too support ending the occupation, like most Israelis and most American Jews do, but like many of them, you don't believe that BDS is the right strategy to achieve the outcome they're hoping for, a safe and democratic and secure Jewish state living peacefully beside a Palestinian state. You can tell them that many people, many believe that BDS is problematic because it singles out Israel for a level of opprobrium as though it is the world's worst state actor. And while it's nonviolent, it acts as a sledgehammer instead of the scalpel that we really need. Many of us, many people see that BDS inflames the debate and strengthens the radical right, that it will only further entrench Israel in an isolationist narrative, the whole world is against us, that it handicaps the very people who are most likely to help bring about a two-state solution, Israeli academics and artists and entrepreneurs. Some, when you speak about having compassion for Palestinian children, will call you a capo or a Nazi. Some will accuse you of throwing Jewish babies into boxcars. You don't need to respond to these people. They won't hear you anyway. What you need to do is delete these people from your page and go get a glass of wine because you deserve it. <laughs> Sometimes it happens that the day before Yom Kippur, you get scooped by Ari Shavit. What he wrote yesterday in Haaretz was so powerful that I believe it bears reiterating. Here's what he said. Those who fought for peace and freedom and equality in Britain and France and the US did it while loving their homelands and expressing pride in their nation, at the same time demanding that it changes its ways. So it should be in Israel too. There are bad things happening here that must be opposed, he said. But there's all, there are also innumerable things that inspire and that must not be ignored. Israel is indeed fighting for its culture, its morals, and its soul. But we should not be defeatist in these battles because they can still be won. Israel's existence may be threatened by its prolonged rule over another people, but that control cannot be ended by hatred, only by love. 
only with pride and only with our heads held high. He closed by saying that our grandparents, our parents and our siblings have performed miracles in this land. And it is our responsibility not to let these miracles slip into the depths. Shavit's charge is as critical for American Jews to hear as it is for Israelis. It's important for you to know that there is both an organizational and an intellectual foundation for a thoughtful, progressive, engaged, and loving Zionism that honors the great promise of the state and is willing to fight for its better nature. So today, on this Yom Kippur, I beg you, please do not walk away. We need you to be a part of that conversation. Shana Tova.